you know, the right rod will make you a better angler. Yeah, you know, some guys don't quite make the connection. For example, how many fish have you caught or actually hooked, but they've come unbuttoned before you can get them to you? Or how many bites did you, eh, you weren't sure whether or not it was a bite, kind of felt mushy, you weren't sure if it was a bite or a weed. Or how many bites did you actually miss? Think about it another way. Fishing rods are designed for different purposes. There's a whole wide variety of fishing rods for bass fishing, and you got different techniques, different lures, and it's you know it's kind of like golf clubs, really. When you go golfing, you don't bring just one club. You bring a bunch because you're going to encounter different situations, and there's different clubs suited for each of those situations, and it's much the same with bass fishing. You know, a rod that's really good for casting long distances isn't as good for, say, short, accurate casts. Or a rod that's really good for throwing small baits with small treble hooks is not a, really a good rod for flipping and pitching heavier lures with strong, thick hooks into thick cover. So how do you decide? You know, you've got different power ratings, medium, medium, heavy, heavy, heavy. What is that? And to make things even more confusing, there aren't any set standards. This is a real... <laughs> what one manufacturer's medium heavy is another one's heavy, for example. So add to that, there's also some personal preferences. You know, guys with taller statues tend to have longer rods. They, they, it works better for them. The guys that are shorter, those longer rods are a little bit unwieldy, a little bit more difficult to use, so a shorter rod will work, even though both rods might be a medium heavy, fast action rod. But one guy will say, use a longer rod, while the other guy will tell you to use a shorter rod. So how do you decide what rods to get? Well, let me help you out with some of that. First of all, I'm going to talk about rod components, because that's really going to determine which rod is right for you, both from a budget standpoint and also what are some of the characteristics that you want to look for for the purpose that you're trying to get the rod for. And lastly, uh, I'm going to talk about four different techniques that you use in bass fishing. And the recommended rods are like the best rods for those type of purposes, just to give you the general direction, give you an idea of what you should get. So first of all, rods, let's talk about the components, starting with a rod blank. The blanks, really when it comes to, to bass fishing, there's two different materials they make the blanks out of. It's either graphite or fiberglass. Fiberglass used to be the only game in town. It used to be all rods were made out of fiberglass. And for good reason. They're flexible, they're forgiving, they're really good at keeping fish pinned, um, but they are a little bit heavy and they're not very sensitive. Just fiberglass isn't a good conductor. So it has its drawbacks, but it still has its purpose in bass fishing. And we'll get to that in a minute. Graphite, on the other hand, the rods are lightweight, they're stiffer, they're more sensitive, but they're not the all being of all things. You know, marketers like to talk about graphite rods in terms of modulus. You know, modulus is basically, it's a marketing type term that kind of tells you like how much graphite or the way the graphite is woven, woven into the material to uh, make the rods. I'm being general here, guys. If you're, you know, an astute rod builder, you'll know I'm, I'm kind of skimming on the top here. I'm, I'm not going to dive into <laughs> all of the, the mechanics of this. Just, you know, give you a general idea of what I'm talking about. But the marketers, they want you to believe the higher the modulus, the better the rod. Well, yes, with a caveat. So, in general, yes, the, the higher the modulus, the lighter the rod, the more sensitive it is. However, the higher the modulus, also the more brittle it is. So, you know, more fragile if you want to look at it that way. But if you're a shore angler, if you whap the rod against a branch or along a dock or something, or if you're in a boat and you hit it against the console or on your trolling motor, you've created a weak spot in that rod and it may snap on you on a hook set or fighting a fish back to you if you have a really high modulus rod. You, so you got to be careful about that. So what the manufacturers have done is a couple different things to combat that. One of them is to blend graphite and fiberglass and they make what's called a composite rod. 
composite rods have been around a long time. This is nothing new. As a matter of fact, my first full set of rods that I was able to afford when I got out of college was all composite. They're inexpensive. So it's a great rod to use. And it's got a lot of the characteristics of both. It's got the, the, the flexibility and the durability of fiberglass, and it's got a lot of the sensitivity and the lightweight from graphite. So those work pretty well. But you also are blending in some of the negative characteristics of those two. Primarily you lose sensitivity. That's kind of the key thing. And some of the strength that you see in graphite, you're losing some of that, um, which is desirable a lot in bass fishing. But they make good rods. But there's a place in it in bass fishing, and I'll explain to that in just a second. One other thing that they're doing, I shouldn't say one, but one of the things they're also doing, the manufacturers, to improve this brittleness of graphite rods, is they're incorporating carbon fiber into the rods. A lot of it's marketing. You gotta be careful about that. Some rod manufacturers will say, hey, it's got carbon fiber in it, but really what it is is just a thin, basically a thin layer of paper that wraps around the outside of the rod that is made out of carbon fiber, but it really structurally doesn't do much. It's more of, you know, eye candy. But they'll claim, hey, it's got carbon fiber. Uh, some of the mount rod manufacturers are actually incorporating carbon fiber into the material, weave it into the material, and they're using that as part of the, you know, it's sort of a graphite carbon fiber blend in the rods. And that makes them lighter and more durable. And that is, uh, you know, actually, <laughs> that's one of the, some of the better rods out there are built that way. You can tell when they're doing that by the price. Carbon fiber is expensive. And so typically the higher price rods that say they have carbon fiber in them, they actually have them as part of the integrated material that they're using to build the rod, the, the rod blanks. Also between manufacturers, they have different ways of building the rods. Some of them are really high tech and using manufacturing processes that are pretty advanced. Some of them have different curing and drying processes and it can go on and on. I'm not gonna get into all the specifics, but just understand, the point that I'm trying to make here, long-winded way of saying, it's real difficult to compare one rod from a manufacturer to another rod from a manufacturer, even though the specs may be the same, the prices may be different. Part of the reason is because of you know what I've just told you. Another reason is the line guides. The line guides, to me, are just as critical as the rod blank, if not more so. You can take a rod blank that's really well made and kind of ruin it by putting average line guides on it and vice versa. You can take an average rod blank and improve it by putting better line guides on it. And prices vary greatly with line guides and that's going to affect the cost of the rods. Let me give you an example. Oh, before I get into that, <laughs> if you are investigating, you're, you're probably watching this video because you want to learn a lot about rods and you may have come across some information that tells you that braid doesn't work well with line guides. Braid can can damage the rod guides, can you know put a V in them, or the rod guides can get damaged to the point where now they're damaging the line from braid, that sort of stuff. That used to be an issue. Back when braid started gaining popularity of bass fishing in the early 2000s, you bet. The rods weren't quite designed, the, re, the, the line guides weren't designed really to handle braid in that manner. And a lot of the braid back then was just uh, four forward strands and that enabled them to get a lot of dirt and muck in, you know, in between the weaves from the, just from the lakes and it made it coarser and they, yeah, kind of like act, acted like sandpaper on the line guides and actually would cut a groove into the line guides. Well, much of that is, if not all of it, is gone now for two reasons. Number one, lines now are eight strand for the most part, you know, braid is, and they've, they manufacturers have gotten better at making them smoother. So they glide through the guides better and they don't cause any damage. That's one. But the other is the line guides, the, the inserts themselves, the rings are way better than they used to be. Now they're making them on material that are very strong. Things like stainless steel, zirconia, alkanite, you know, SIC, and a bunch of other, you know, types of materials. The bottom line is, is that they're very strong now and durable, and that problem with line guides and braid is gone now. So if you see any of that, just understand that's old history, but that doesn't apply to the new rods of today. And this, this problem kind of went away about 10 years ago. It really hasn't been around anymore. So just wanted to dispel that myth. 
But these materials I told you about, that can also increase the, the price. You know, a, a line guy made out of titanium, that adds price. There's also a couple of guides you need to pay attention to. The, the old standard line guides that you see on most rods and reels have been around for years and decades and they still work great. There's not a problem with them. But of recent years, you see a lot more mini and micro guides. It came out about, started coming out about 15 years ago and you see them a lot now on rods. The difference between mini and micro, micro guides are the smallest. They're very tiny and the mini are like a step between the micro and the standard size. Why you want to go to those is a couple of reasons. They are lighter, so it makes the rod lighter. It's more sensitive. They're closer to the, to the blank, so they can transmit sensitivity a lot better. And because they're smaller, you can add more guides on the rod. And that aids in castability, in control, better accuracy. Plus, it keeps the line off the, the blank. It, when you're fighting a fish. So it's not touching the blank, which could damage the line. So there's lots of benefits to using them. The problem is, is with micro guides, a lot of guys like to use braid the leader and they have a knot in there. Uh, I personally don't use leader, but uh, that's a choice some people like to do. And the knots have a problem going through those micro guides because they're so small. So the mini guides are a little bit bigger. They work just fine if you're a person that likes to use knots and, and leaders. The mini guides are the way to go for you. Again, nothing wrong with the regular size guides, but there's a lot of benefits to the smaller ones. Another component to look at are the real seats. There's really three main materials of the real seats. You'll still find some made out of plastic or plastic materials. They're cheaper. They're not as sensitive. They're not as lightweight, but if you're on a budget, that's the way to go. Just understand they're not very durable either. At some point, the real seat is going to crack. Not right away, but in a few years or so, depending on how much you use them, they're gonna end up cracking. I know because I've had reels like that, and that's exactly what happens. Most real seats are made out of graphite these days, and that's, you know, it's the standard. They're strong, durable, lightweight, sensitive. They do everything you need. Understand that these, these seats also, you'll notice there's a kind of a hole underneath them, and that's by design. You can see there's the, the blank right there, and that's where your fingers rest, so you have direct contact with the blank, and that gives you more sensitivity and feel. But it does make... A difference with the material that the real seat's made of because it can dampen that, for example, if it's plastic. The best of the best, of course, is carbon fiber real seats. These are the ultimate. They're super lightweight, they're very strong and super sensitive, but they're also very expensive. So you only see those in the higher priced rods, but man, they are a dream. If you've been using the graphite reel seats for you know a long time and you're looking to upgrade, there is definitely a difference. And I would recommend it. I have a few. I can't afford a bunch of them, but a few rods I have have the graphite or the, the uh, carbon fiber uh, reel seats. And man, do I like them. It's just, mm, if you can afford them, they're nice. But the graphite, there's nothing wrong with them. Lastly, I want to talk about the handles themselves. This is where your hand grips a hold of the, of, the, of the rod. They're made out of three main materials for bass fishing, EVA foam, cork, and there's a rubber-like material that you see on golf clubs, going back to the golf club analogy. These are more of a personal preference. There's not really a right answer here, but I'll tell you about the three different ones to help you decide which ones you like. The cork has been around the longest as far as what's been used on rods for decades. Cork is durable, it's sensitive, and it, it, it does performs well. It's very comfortable. A lot of guys don't like cork because over time it gets dirty and looks grimy and just aesthetically doesn't look very pleasing. And they're kind of a pain to clean. You can clean them and, and make them look new again, but it takes a little bit of work. The EVA foam solves all that because for the most part they're black and it hides all the dirt and grime. The problem with EVA foam is that it's not as durable as cork and it tends to, you know, you get pitted and little chunks come out of it over time. Again, more aesthetics than it is functionality, so it's not really an issue, but uh, some guys don't like them for that reason. And then also you've got the rubber grips. 
the rubber grips are great. Some guys really like them because if they fish in the rain a lot or their hands are always wet, those grips, you know, it's not going to slip. So, or if you have a hard time gripping the rod, those rubber grips do a really good job of just keeping the rod from slipping out of your hands. I've used all three. I have rods with all three. My preference is between EVA foam and cork. I like them both. Uh, I don't really have a significant preference to either of them. I, the rubber grips I don't like because I feel that deadens the feel of the rod. Just me, I just don't feel that they're sensitive. However, the key thing that I look at, whether it's foam or any of these, is I want as little of that material on the rod as possible for a couple of reasons. One, I only need it where my hand is grabbing the rod. I don't need it to extend the entire length of the rod with the exception of crankbait rods because that requires two hand casting. So you need you know, a long handle so you can grip them with both hands. Otherwise, split grip is what I really like because I just have the area where my hand's holding onto it. I don't need the rest of it because if there's a bunch of extra material there where my hand's never going to touch. It just adds weight to the rod and it kind of diminishes its sensitivity as well. Just my opinion, but that's, I find that split rods, split grip rods are much better. They're lighter, they're easier to use. Um, and I'm not paying for material that I'm not going to use. Uh, to me, rod is a tool, not something you put up on the raw, on the wall and admire. So functionality is important to me. So that's some of the components there. The, the cost between those three different handle types is marginal, so that isn't really going to affect the cost of a rod, but the other components definitely for sure. So those are the key things to look at when you're shopping for rods. Now let's talk about the purposes, different uh, techniques and, and lures and my recommendations for what rods to use for those. Let's start off with spinner baits, chatter baits, and buzz baits. Because you're going to be casting all day long with these rods and lots of casting, casting, casting with these baits, um, you want something that's lightweight. Otherwise, you're going to be fatigued at the end of the day by wielding this heavy rod. Depending on how you fish it, kind of, now we shift into like the rod length. The longer rods, you can cast farther with. The shorter rods are better for short, accurate target casting. So the shorter rods, meaning six foot eight to seven foot, are great when you're going along the shoreline and you're just doing underhand casts and the quick little pitch and flips to you know specific targets. The shorter rod is easier typically because you're the rod is getting down towards the surface of the water and you, with a longer rod you're going to end up hitting it and and that interferes with your cast. The longer rods, of course, are better for long distance. So. You got to think about that, plus your stature as well. From a strength standpoint, a medium heavy power rod is best because these lures have a single hook. Typically, they're a four rod or larger hook, stout hooks. So you need that backbone to be able to set the hook and control the fish while you and keeping them pinned while you get them back to you. So a medium heavy rod, you still want a flexible tip for that casting. So a, a moderate to fast action tip is what you want. So my recommendation for a best all around rod for these type of lures would be a seven foot to seven three medium heavy power fast action rod. Okay, let's talk about top water lures and crankbaits, lightweight top, you know, it's like chug, chuggers, pop bars, things like that, not like the heavier lures like a Zara Spook, but most top water lures and crankbaits. With these, again, you're gonna be casting repeatedly all day long, so a lighter weight rod is better, so you won't be so fatigued. A lot of these also, you're casting long distances, so a longer rod makes sense with these. So it's like a seven and a half foot rod, somewhere in that, you know, seven to seven and a half foot rod is better in this instance. Because you're throwing light lures with small treble hooks, you need, first of all, a rod that's got a lot of flex to be able to make that cast, but also that flexibility will have a lot of give to it while you're fighting the fish back to the boat and won't rip those hooks out. With a stiffer rod, you have the chance of that fish coming unpinned because he's using the rod literally as leverage to rip the hooks free. So for this purpose, this is where the fiberglass rods or the composite rods are a better choice for fishing these lures. The sensitivity is still there because a lot of times when the fish 
bite these <laughs> baits, you feel them, man, they hit really hard. But a composite rod, I feel I'd lean a little more in on the composite rods, mainly because when you're fishing crankbaits, sometimes the difference between pebble and gravel bottoms or clay or mud bottoms is the difference between catching fish and not. Because sometimes the fish are holding on one type and not the other. And when you're reeling in with that crankbait and you're digging on the bottom, a more sensitive rod, you'd be able to tell the difference between those. And so if you're fishing on a pebble bottom and you know that they're more on gravel and you're hitting pebbles, you know to stop, move until you find that gravel area. So I would go more of a composite rod. So the best overall rod to use would be a seven foot four to seven foot eight medium to medium heavy power rod with a fast action tip. Two types of lures that are your bread and butter in bass fishing are your jigs and your Texas rig plastics such as worms. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta have a rod for those. And that can get really confusing because jigs and plastics come in a whole wide variety. You've got from your small worms to your 10 inch worms, from your finesse jigs to your big heavy flipping jigs. No one rod is gonna be able to do it all for you. So let's remove the bookmarks here, the small lures and light lures and the big heavy ones. And let's look at what's in the middle. It's gonna cover a wide range there for most of your, your purposes. For this, you're gonna be casting a lot, a lot of flipping and pitching and casting. So again, a lightweight rod is important here. All of these lures you're using a single hook. So you need backbone, you need some power to set that hook. They're a stronger hook, especially if you're throwing into heavier cover, you're using a flipping hook or something strong. So you need a rod that's got some good backbone to it. You still want a flexible tip for that casting and that sensitivity. Bites are difficult to detect sometimes with these lures. So a more sensitive rod, maybe this is why I might spend a little more to get more of a carbon fiber graphite rod if I were you, because that, that sensitivity is what really makes the difference in detecting some of these really subtle bites. So that's important in those micro guides too, and mini guides. This is if you want to spend some money, this is probably where you need to do it. And also length of rod. So length of rod is, you want a little bit longer rod here because a lot of times you, you need that leverage to pull the fish out of cover, or if you're fishing really deep, 15 feet or deeper, a longer rod allows you to pull up a lot of that slack line to set, it, set the hook. So the best overall rod for this here would be a, a graphite rod that's seven foot four to seven foot 10, medium heavy power, maybe even a heavy power with a fast action tip. Now I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about flipping and pitching because this is a mainstay of bass fishing. So you've got to have the right rod for this because it is a specific type of technique in certain kind of cover. And even though you're using worms and jigs like I mentioned before, but this is a specific technique when you're fishing heavier cover and you're wrenching fish out of thicker cover. So it requires a different rod. You're not so concerned about making longer casts here. Because these lures are typically a little bit heavier again have stout hooks and you're using stronger line usually braid here you know 40 to 50 pound or stronger test pound that requires stout equipment so a rod that's got a stiff backbone like a heavy power backbone something really strong to be able to set that hook and fight that fish and pull them out of that cover is what you need. You still need that sensitivity because the bite is often very subtle. So a real sensitive rod is important here. And you need that, that flexible tip for accurate pitches and casting into the, the cover. It's very target specific type of casting. And you're gonna be holding the rod a lot of times at the nine o'clock position or a little bit higher and you're gonna be doing this all day long. So a lightweight rod is much easier on the wrist and the hands and the forearms. You're not gonna be so fatigued at the end of the day by using a lighter weight rod. So that's really important to look at when you're shopping for rods. As for length, this is where a little bit of personal preference comes in because for years they used to say, you know, seven and a half foot or longer rod is what you need for flipping and pitching. Well, I took that advice and I'm, you know, I'm 5'8", five, 5'9", five, I'm a shorter kind of guy. Rods like that, you're hitting the water 
when you're trying to flip and pitch. And it just, you know, next thing you know, you're like this, you're just, you can't work them very well. So if you're shorter in stature, a little bit shorter rod is a lot easier to use for flipping and pitching, where if you're a taller guy, you can use some of those longer rods. So you have to take that in consideration. It makes a big impact on which length of rod you can use. That said, I think the best overall rod to use is somewhere in that seven foot four to seven foot eight range, heavy to heavy power rod with a fast action tip or extra fast action tip is what you need for flipping and pitching. Oh, made out of graphite. And again, if you can afford it, you can get the graphite carbon fiber composite and if you can't afford that, at least go with the mini guides to give you that extra sensitivity and make a big difference in detecting those bites. So there you go, guys. That's like some general things for you to look for when you're shopping. I hope that helps. Wait, hold on. If you watch this video this long, then you for sure want to watch one of these two videos here. This one here, this is the one I recommend that you watch next. This one over here, this is what YouTube thinks you should watch next. Either way, I'm in both videos, so I'll see you in a couple seconds.